Good afternoon to everybody, or at least to those that are based in Europe. Good evening if you are in China. Um, welcome to today's webinar session on blockchain technologies in China. Uh, the event is going to be open my, by Mr. Bernard DeWitt. Um, we are going to wait a couple of seconds uh, or minutes until we get everybody in the room, which is uh, already happening. Okay, hello, Ra. We are ready. Okay, great. So, uh, Mr. Dewitt, we are leaving a few 30 seconds to the participants to enter we the room Laura. aggressively. And then we can start. Okay, I think uh, we no, are almost I don't hear all here. Oh, we might have some connection problem with Mr. Dewitt. Okay, I think we are ready to go. Um, Mr. Dewitt, even if you don't hear us, uh, we can hear you. So perhaps you can start. Hello? Hello, Mr. Dewitt, are you there? Well, it seems we're having some technical issues. So what we are gonna do is um, when we are gonna start um, with the next part of the presentation. Oh, here we are, it seems. Sorry for the technical issue. Okay, so I think yeah. now you hear me, Laura. Yes, here we are. Sorry. No we problem. Had a problem. Yeah. We are ready. Listening to you. Oh, uh, well, Mr. Dewitt, um, we are starting the event. So, um, as we understood, we are going to have some welcome speech from your side. So, all of us are eager to, to hear it. Okay. Thank you, Laura. Thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It's a real pleasure and a honor for our chamber to uh, organize this afternoon session together with the EU uh, SME Center. Um, I would say that before introducing very shortly uh, our chamber, um, it's a, a pleasure to organize each year uh, an event with the EU SME Center. A US Center is a one of the nice examples of successful um, um, undertakings by uh, supported by the EU. Our chamber, uh, for those of you who do not uh, know it, uh, our Belgian Chinese Chamber of Commerce is a business association uh, for companies doing business uh, with China uh, from Belgium and Europe and for Chinese companies uh, located uh, here in Belgium. We have been created uh, in the 80s. Uh, we have more than 550 members and our purpose is to be a bridge between uh, Belgium and China for uh, enterprises. We change, yeah, we can change. Uh, what do we do? Well, we uh, organize uh, networking events, we receive uh, delegations, we organize company visits, uh, we have regularly conferences on EU-China relations, we organize uh, seminars, either ourselves or uh, in uh, coordination with other organizations like uh, today. Um, we are located uh, here in Belgium, and for those of you who do not know us, you have all our details uh, here uh, through the internet. And uh, I am sure to, that with the slides, 
of today you will receive uh, our details. We were uh, very interested to uh, listen to uh, the uh, very um, good speakers of the EU uh, SME Center. They will be introduced by uh, Laura after me. Uh, I would like to say that uh, blockchain technology is something you need to take into account. And blockchain technology developed in China is even more interesting as a China is the place where uh, blockchain has been uh, mostly developed these last uh, years. Uh, what is blockchain? What are the implications for European uh, SMEs? Um, what is uh, China using the technology for? All these questions will be uh, answered uh, this afternoon by uh, our speakers. The, our speakers will be introduced by um, Laura Velasco. So therefore, I will leave her the floor and then to our speakers. I thank you again for your attention. Thank you. Laura, it's up to you. Here I am. Thank you very much. It's always a pleasure to cooperate with the Belgian Chinese Chamber of Commerce. I hope you all are seeing my screen right now. Um, before actually leaving the floor to today's speakers, uh, I would like to share a couple of slides, uh, a little bit more of a couple of slides of the EU SME Center, um, who we are and what we are doing. Um, and I will also be uh, introducing, as Mr. DeWitt was mentioning, uh, the two speakers we have today. Uh, the USME Center is a European Union uh, founded project that was launched in 2010. So it's been 11 years running uh, with the aim of uh, helping European SMEs enter the Chinese market. Our goal is to make sure that the companies who are looking into China are uh, well prepared uh, to ensure um, a success into the Chinese market. At the current moment, we are implemented by five chambers of commerce uh, that you can find actually at the bottom of the slide. We are also an official member of the European Enterprise Network, which allows us to, to work with a lot of uh, partners in Europe. And uh, we have offices located in Beijing. And uh, thanks to Eurochambre, we are also based in Brussels as a contact point for all those European businesses. Uh, for our services, uh, we provide uh, four main services, although we also can tailor-made um, our services for, for our partners. Uh, the first of them is the Knowledge Center. We have an online library accessible for everybody where you can find over 200 uh, market reports, guidelines and study cases uh, on a very uh, wide variety of topics. Could be food and beverage, environment and green tech, blockchain technology, uh, taxation, HR, etc. The second service is called Advice Center. In our website, you have a section where, uh, this, which is called Ask the Expert, where actually we can provide confidential and one-to-one -one consultation on China-related topics. Um, uh, here you have uh, a list of uh, different type of, uh, let's say, topics that we can cover, and our experts will be replying to those inquiries uh, within three to four working days. The third service is uh, our training center. A very good example is what we are doing today. Uh, we offer uh, tailor-made trainings uh, based on the needs of the European uh, SMEs. Um, the variety is obviously upon request. Uh, today, blockchain, uh, it's uh, very new and trending topics, but we can also provide trainings on other uh, topics such as knowing your partners in China, e-commerce, digital marketing, etc. Last but not least, uh, we also provide advocacy services uh, as we give voice to those European SMEs that are looking for a more level play uh, field in, in China, in those, especially in those sectors where actually uh, foreign companies find some roadblocks. Uh, this is a list of, of the partners with whom we cooperate uh, often. And uh, I just want to uh, share uh, our upcoming activities. Um, 
that we are organizing in collaboration with some of our partners in the in the coming weeks and days. Um, the slides will be distributed afterwards upon request, uh, but we will also be recording this training session and we will be uploading it on our YouTube channel. Um, after this event, you will receive a thank you email with the direct link to this presentation so that you can uh, access it directly. Now, about the speakers. Uh, the first of our speakers today, although they are going to be sifting, it's going to be a very dynamic uh, presentation, is Renzo Isler, who is also right now at the moment uh, the director of the USME Center. Renzo is an expert in financial services, strategic insurance, consultancy, business strategy, and strategic planning and risk management. Born in Italy, but uh, being a, con a cosmopolite who has traveled around the world, um, Renzo has over 15 years of professional experience in China. Uh, all of this uh, experience has been developed uh, working with uh, Generali Group, which is one of the largest financial enterprises in Europe. Uh, Renzo speaks Italian, English, German, and French, and I think he's fighting with Chinese as well. About our second speaker, Brian, uh, who is right now in Vancouver. Uh, good morning, Brian, for you. Uh, he's the managing director of Bravo Well Technology in North America. Uh, his areas of expertise are finance and technology, blockchain-based financial services, and blockchain technology. Brian has over 20 years of experience in finance and technology industries thanks to his cooperation with both American and Chinese entities. He has also collaborated uh, with the startups uh, such as Telecom uh, in California or Dynamic Fintech in Shanghai. He's also an independent researcher, mainly in the area of fintech. That is the reason why Brian is here today. And now I don't want to take more time from the speakers. I'm going to stop uh, sharing my presentation and uh, I leave the floor to you. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Thank you, Laura. And uh, thank you also to Mr. David for the introduction and good day to everyone. Uh, Roberto Viola, uh, Director General of DigiConnect, uh, just uh, one month ago said uh, Europe's ambition is to set the gold standard for blockchain technologies. We have implemented a strong regulatory and policy framework that supports sustainable blockchain innovation as well as the startup and scale up ecosystems. Administrations across Europe play a trailblazing role in implementing this exciting and essential new technology. Conversely, uh, Xi Jinping, president of the People's Republic of China, a few months ago underscored the importance and role of blockchain technology in the new round of technological innovation and industrial transformation of China. He highlighted the role of blockchain in promoting data sharing, optimizing business processes, reducing operating costs, improving collaborative efficiency, and building a trusted system. With these premises, with key players singing on the same tune, we can surely say that we are right on the money being here today to discuss the potential and the future of blockchain in the business development of the EU SMEs in China. From the, from the agenda that you see, uh, we have a busy program ahead of us. Brian and I will alternate in presenting six modules, which we hope will stimulate your interest and tickle your curiosity. Module one is going to be an introduction to blockchain, and then we move on to a parallel comparison of blockchain and the Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies. Then we'll have an overview of the potentials of a blockchain technology moving then into uh, dig, deep in, uh, dig, uh, digging deep in China and to see what are the current developments of blockchain today in China. And uh, concluding with an outlook on future of blockchain, both in China and the rest of the world. The, the final module will be a, a series of case studies that we will present to your attention, which uh, I hope again that it will tickle your, your, your interest and uh, probably and hopefully will bring you to uh, further elaborate and further study on the blockchain technology. So um, I will be uh, starting on, uh, on this uh, introduction to blockchain 
and I move on to the first part. Uh, I want also to express the fact that here we're not, this is not going to be a lecture. I don't want this to be a lecture. Uh, this is supposed to be a dialogue on blockchain and its applications present and future. So um, in here, the first thing that uh, is, uh, I want to show you a little bit of history. Bubble history is a bit of a overstatement because the blockchain is really very, very young uh, uh, technology that has been brought to our attention. So um, although in 1992, two scientists, Stuart Haver and Scott Stornetta presented a work on the same concept, it wasn't until 2008 that a formal protocol was written by a Satoshi Nakamoto designing blockchain as we know it today. Uh, in uh, 2009, he, she, they, it, whoever that uh, Nakamoto is, created Bitcoin. And for years, blockchain was exclusively associated with uh, Bitcoin. In uh, 2011, uh, already many cryptos mushroomed. We were still remaining in the field of uh, cryptocurrencies. In 2014, uh, with the advent of Ethereum and the NEO, uh, smart contracts uh, were introduced. And this was, a, but it wasn't really until 2018, so we're talking let's, uh, three years ago, uh, that blockchain technology became conceptualized for multiple utilizations. Uh, and I must say, although there has been a great, great uh, number of um, applications, but still uh, they have been used sparingly. And uh, I hope that along this, uh, this presentation that we will have today, we will be able to uh, bring you an, to an understanding about uh, uh, why this, uh, the, the, the blockchain has uh, picked up so, so fast, but at the same time is still in its infancy. So what is blockchain? Uh, we are trying, I try, I'm gonna try not to be very technical. Uh, this is not my objective. Uh, but here, blockchain is a, it's a kind of a database, which uh, by employing cryptography, records information in a ledger and stores it in a block in such a way that it becomes immutable. Once filled, each block is cast in stone, given a timestamp and chained together to the previous block by a hash code, becoming part of its timeline. Then this uh, string of blocks with their own hash codes, timestamps and ledgers are housed in a number of computers, which are called nodes, all connected to one another. All of these nodes are potential actors or validators of the next blocks. So uh, clearly here blocks are decentralized, they're encrypted, so that there is no way of going back, erasing or modifying the data. So the, time, the timeline is irreversible. A node can only choose to make changes in the ledger by adding another block to the chain. So here we're already coming to a very crucial part of the advantages of blockchain. It's, it's the fact that you cannot erase what has been cast in stone, what has been written. Uh, it, it cannot be, so you cannot have somebody tampering uh, with, with the past information or data, erasing them and substituting with something else. Now, this is, it, it's not possible. The only way to, to modify a, a set of information is to add another block and say, oh, the previous block said this, now this has turned into something, something different. And what is also very important to understand is that no single entity in the network can amend the past data entries in the ledgers and no single entity can approve new additions to the ledger without the approval by the whole network of nodes. So the decentralization of uh, this, the data, of all this, this, this data is, uh, is the biggest breakthrough because in the traditional forms, uh, like for large companies and corporations, they have the data that is centered into big mainframes. Um, put in particular uh, storage areas, in particular rooms or particular locations. And, and, and that's it, it's, it they're, they're all there. Then of course you have to have another fireproof uh, or, 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 or uh, let's say earthquake proof location in another place 
to have a duplicate, but uh, this is not what blockchain is. Blockchain is just the, the same, exactly the same information, the same data, the same uh, string of information. It's a, it is dispersed uh, across a number of computers. Uh, and in this case, of course, computers called, they're called nodes. So at any point in time, only one version of the ledger exists and each node owns a full and up-to-date copy of the entire ledger. And the distributed nature of the ledger requires that the participants in the network know in these nodes to reach a consensus regarding the validity of the new data entries and by following a specific peer-to-peer -peer protocol. So there is a rule, there is a regulation on how these uh, uh, the players are going to be played uh, playing in this uh, in this protocol. Uh, and, and it's gonna be very, very clear what each one of them, each one of the nodes will have to do in order to accept or not accept an additional block. So uh, to recap uh, on these uh, key concepts, I think that there are key words that we have to remember, you have to keep in mind. Ledger, timestamp, hash codes, all these three things uh, all wrapped up in blocks. The ledger with all the, the, the key information, the data, the information, the timestamps that basically seals uh, the, the, the moment that all this data have been stored. The hash code, which is uh, uh, the, the, the identifier, uh, which is an alphanumerical number, uh, which has been, which is uh, allocated to each block. And it's necessary to have that hash code in order to connect the next block. And in fact, each block contains the data of the previous hash code to which it connects and its, its own new hash code, which will be available for the next block to be connected. On top of this, of course, uh, we have the nodes. And uh, the nodes are key because uh, they are the owners of the blockchain and they have to give consensus for any change that it may be uh, applicable. So in this case, uh, we are creating an immutable database uh, with an irreversible timeline. There are, um, there are more, let's say, other names and, 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 and other things that uh, will sometimes uh, come up uh, like uh, the nonce, uh, uh, some of you may have heard about it. This is an alphanumerical string, which received after successful completion of a crypto puzzle. Uh, and this is mostly utilized uh, for cryptocurrencies. And then uh, you have, of course, a digital signature and the keys to unlock access to the blockchain technology. Uh, these are, uh, of course, all parts of uh, a whole system. What is uh, important here for us is to understand the basic uh, structure of the blockchain technology. And also the next important thing to understand before we move to the next phase is to understand the types of blockchains that are available today on the market, that are produced on the market. The first one is the public permissionless. Then we have a public permissioned, and then we have a private one. The, the names themselves kind of identify uh, what, they, what they are. In the public permissionless, it's uh, no restriction. Anyone with an interest with internet connection can get access to the network. It's self-governed, it's anonymous, it's decentralized, it's autonomous. It's a public digital ledger. And it's all in addition, it's transparent, owned by everybody and it's immutable. Well, this is the fundamental of Bitcoin and uh, Ethereum, so Ether, as it is the crypto of Ethereum and other cryptocurrencies. And it's uh, this public permissionless, it is mostly utilized for the cryptocurrency uh, blockchain utilization. The, there are, there's one, but I would say more than just one downside, uh, and it, it's uh, slow. Uh, and the reason why it's slow, especially for the Bitcoin is that there are so many nodes, so, so many participants to that, and as you remember, I said that each one of them has to give their okay. So before you get the okay from each one of them, it may take time. In some cases, it may take days before uh, the whole process is completed and it is accepted. 
And the other thing is that it's also costly because uh, um, in order to, to gain possession of a Bitcoin, you have to run X number of trials in order to solve the big puzzle. Uh, Brian will be, will be elaborating uh, later on on this particular issue. And uh, it is, uh, well, it's a pollutant. Uh, let, 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 let's put it this way, because in order all the computers to run all those uh, simulations and all those trials, you need a lot of power, you need a lot of energy. So it, it burns a lot of energy and um, it actually goes in a bit of a different direction of this uh, carbon-free concept that uh, the world now is talking about. The second uh, type of blockchain is a permissioned public blockchain. This act uh, as a closed ecosystem. Users are not freely able to join the network. Uh, so, and this is a clearly preferred by centralized organizations in order to secure the record transactions and exchange information between one, one another. Uh, it has an efficient performance, clearly. It is a proper governance structure. It's a, it has a decentralized storage. It is cost-effective. Um, a downside, well, of course, it's a, it's, it's a comprom potentially compromised security. It is under, under the control of somebody, something or somebody, some entity. Uh, therefore, it can be subject to censorship. So you cannot say or cannot, cannot do or act at, at will. And uh, it has to follow a very a much closer protocol in terms of regulation. Even more tighter is uh, the private one, but this for its own purpose. So that's the way they wanted to have it like that. And the private one is, uh, is, is owned and operated by a group of organizations. And the transactions are visible only to the members of the network. So it's a, it's a cherry picking kind of, uh, uh, of network that uh, uh, the owners of a private blockchain chooses to have. And the focus is clearly on privacy instead of a full disclosure and the security of sensitive information. Uh, this, uh, I think the, in, in, in every one of you, uh, in, in every one of your minds, you already have a picture, examples of cases that uh, could fit into this particular uh, condition. So um, these three public permissionless, uh, public permissioned and private are the, the, the typical blockchain types that uh, are currently uh, used on the market. Uh, if uh, so, considering that we will be uh, more or less analyzing non-crypto uh, um, blockchains, you will see that uh, in our examples, especially in the case studies, uh, we either will be talking about the public permission or the private. Uh, so I hope that I have been able to give you uh, a relatively uh, quick and uh, dirt, quick and dirty, as we could say, but sufficiently clear uh, explanation of uh, what a blockchain is and uh, the different types of blockchains that are available on the market. And uh, so, at this point, I would uh, leave the floor to uh, my friend Brian. Who, by the way, I, I, I don't envy you, Brian, because I think that for you in Vancouver, it's about 5.30 in the morning. So um, I hope you have a good cup of coffee with you and, uh, and try to stay with us. So um, unless, uh, Brian, if you have perhaps uh, some questions that may have pop up, popped up uh, on the, on the Q&A screen that you may have seen, uh, since uh, we may have a little bit of time, uh, you, can, you can ask me one or two of those questions and I'll see if I can answer. Brian? Well, in the meantime, Brian replies. Um, so, so far we have okay. received no questions, uh, okay. but uh, I, I remind everybody that they can use the Q&A button that appears on their um, uh, screen uh, to uh, submit any question they might want in regards to uh, blockchain. Um, we, as, as you have seen, uh, Renzo and Brian will be checking into this section uh, frequently and they will be replying uh, little by little. And actually, we have received one. <laughs> uh, do you have any example of public and private uh, blockchain? Yeah. 
Yeah, of course. Uh, and in fact, uh, this is something that we will be presenting at the end in our case studies. So rather than answering directly, uh, I would uh, ask for your patience. Dirk uh, Witt, uh, I think it's Dirk Witz. Uh, so I, we, will, we, will, we will be, I think that we'll be able to answer that question uh, uh, on the module number six when we go into case studies. Okay. Uh, thank you. you. Yep. Thank you, Renzo. Uh, thank you, Laura, for the introduction. And uh, good day, everybody. Uh, I'm really pleased to have this opportunity to share some of the knowledge and experiences that I've been uh, working with uh, for the past couple of years uh, on the issues uh, in, in, in the areas of fintech. And I, in continuing uh, the topic uh, following by Renzo, uh, I'm talking about right now, there is a big miss between a lot of people, when people talking about blockchain and people automatically thinking about Bitcoins. So right now, uh, today I'm gonna talk about some of the major differences and, and how, uh, how, diff, uh, how important uh, blockchain is. So first of all, what is blockchain? Uh, what is Bitcoin? Simply put, uh, Bitcoin is both a digital currency and a cryptocurrency. Uh, it is a decentralized digital currency without any central bank or single administrator. And it can be sent from user to user on a peer-to-peer -peer Bitcoin blockchain network without a need for intermediaries. So Bitcoin is uh, first created uh, back in January, 2009, following the 2008 US subprime mortgage crisis. It follows the idea set out in a white paper by the mysterious and uh, pseudonymous Satoshi Nakamoto. Satoshi wrote in the following on a peer-to-peer -peer online forum. He said, the root problem with the conventional currency is all the trust that is requested to make it work. The central bank must be trusted not to debase the currency, but the history of fiat currency is full of breaches of that trust. Banks must be trusted to hold our money and transfer it electronically, but they lend it out in waves of credit bubbles with barely a fraction in reserves. So Satoshi wanted to create a trustless cash system. He explicitly stated that the reason for creating such digital cash system is to remove the third party intermediaries that are traditionally required to conduct digital money tra transfers. So in a way, Bitcoin was created to solve two major problems of the old payment system. The first one is money transfers through, through third party. And the second is how to prove the payment, uh, which is the issue of double spending. So Bitcoin is the first decentralized peer-to-peer -peer payment network. Uh, that is powered by its user with no central authority or middleman. It is composed of collection of computer nodes that enables a new payment system through consensus algorithm, uh, which, which is designed to solve the issues of trust between network participants for digital money transactions. In order to make the concept work, adding blocks to each chain must be relatively difficult. So uh, this is where the proof of work and mining comes in. Each block is secured through cryptographic techniques that require that require miners to commit computing powers in order to add blocks. So used for payments, the consensus algorithm is the final piece in the complex cryptographic puzzle that makes cryptocurrency work. So Bitcoin mining is rewarded by the network through transaction fees and subsidies of new coins to encourage miners to spend their resources on mining new coin, Bitcoin blocks so what determines the value of the Bitcoin? Ultimately, 
uh, the value of the Bitcoin is determined by what people will pay for it. So in this case, uh, there's some similarities to how stocks are priced. However, without a government or central authority controlling the supply, value is totally open to interpretation. At the process of price discovery, the primary driver of volatility in Bitcoin price will invite speculation and manipulation. So here are some basic uh, facts for Bitcoin. So the supply, the supply, the total supply of Bitcoin is limited to 21 million, uh, which means only 21 million Bitcoin can be mined in total. So once miners have unlocked all these amount of Bitcoins, the supply will be exhausted. And currently there are close to 19 million coins being mined as of January, 2021. So that re represent about 88.5% of the total supply. The price of the Bitcoin gained roughly about 350% during the past six months till this past February. And the market cap of Bitcoin just reached over 1 trillion US dollars in fe on February 19, 2021. So uh, there are some concepts uh, alongside with the Bitcoins, uh, which is Bitcoin, cryptocurrency, and digital currency. So they're kind of uh, all interrelated. So I'll give a brief definition about some of those concepts. So digital currency is a currency money or money-like assets that is primarily managed, stored, or exchanged on digital computer system, especially over the internet. So examples of digital currency includes cryptocurrencies, virtual currencies, central bank digital currencies, and e-cash. And digital currency can be either centralized, uh, which there's a central point of control over money supply, or decentralized, where money supply can come from various sources. Uh, the other one, cryptocurrency, or we call it cryptos, is a digital and virtual currency that is secured by cryptography distributed across a large number of computer network, which makes it nearly impossible to counterfeit or double spend. This uh, decentralized structure allows them to exist outside the control of government and central authorities and most cryptocurrencies are decentralized networks based on blockchain technologies. Uh, here are some of the basic facts on cryptocurrency. There are at least over 4,000 cryptocurrencies in the market by the end of 2020. And actually it is still growing. The top 20 cryptocurrencies make up nearly 90% of the total market. And the global crypto market size in terms of market cap, uh, it's over 1.5 trillion US dollars uh, where Bitcoin pretty much dominates. So I'm gonna give you some uh, examples of the crypto currencies, uh, which are, I categorize them by functionality and their lineages, if you, if you would say. The first category, is a uh, money transfer payment mechanism. So since the inception of Bitcoin, which we consider the granddaddy of all cryptos, there are new cryptos coming up with improved functionalities and efficiencies. Some of them are created as the spin-off or forks uh, in the technical term from the original Bitcoin. So uh, the original, the first Bitcoin was created by Satoshi in, uh, back in 2009. And after that, there comes Litecoin, uh, which is launched in 2011. Uh, the Litecoin basically is a spin-off, which is a, a fork version of the Bitcoin, but with improved uh, speed in terms of generation of block and also improved 
transfer, uh, tra uh, also improve uh, 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 transaction speed. So for example, uh, it takes two and a half minutes to create the process of block on the Litecoin compared to 10 minutes uh, from Bitcoin. So that is a significant improvement. And after that, in August 2017, there comes Bitcoin Cash, another spin-off or fork version of the original Bitcoins. And it, it, it comes with another additional improvement in terms of scalability and the speed of transaction. So the second category uh, is for, crypto, for, for cryptocurrencies are uh, with a functionality called a smart contracts. So following the same logic, more cryptos emerges, emerges and providing uh, added functionality and better performances. So uh, the Ethereum's, which is the second most popular cryptocurrency, went alive in July 2015. It was considered the second generation blockchain application. Uh, it's designed for application like, like smart contract. So uh, after Ethereum, in, uh, in the midst of 2017, uh, a new, another new crypto currency come up called the Cardano. Uh, actually, it's interesting. The founder of the Cardano is also the co-founder of the Ethereum. Uh, but he left the Ethereum after the dispute. Cardano is con considered the third generation blockchain application. Cardano aims to be the financial operating system of the world by establishing decentralized financial products, similarly to Ethereum, as well as providing solutions for chain interoperability, voter fraud, and legal contract tracing, among other things. And in the same year, 2017, another crypto came up uh, called a Chainlink. A Chainlink is basically created, created to incentivize data providers, uh, which called oracles, to act as a bridge between blockchain smart contracts and external data sources. So every oracle, so every data provider within the Chainlink network is incentivized to provide accurate data since a reputation score is assigned to each. Further, when nodes follow the software of rules and provides useful data, they are rewarded in Chainlink's cryptocurrency called the Link, L-I-N-K. So as of 2020, Chainlink is seeking to support all blockchain-based smart contract networks. Uh, the third category uh, with functionality for the uh, cryptocurrency is uh, called interoperability. And with the, the latest uh, crypto came up in uh, back in March, 2019 called a Cosmo, C-O-S-M-O-S. And it's aimed to become the internet of blockchain, which is going to solve the problem for, problems of interoperability. So it has uh, embedded function called inter-blockchain communication called IBC with hubs and zone architectures. And now we're gonna come down to the, uh, uh, the key point. So what's blockchain has to do with the Bitcoin and is, is Bitcoin same as blockchain? So basically blockchain is the underlying technology which provides foundational infrastructure for Bitcoin and cryptocurrency to operate. The Bitcoin or cryptos is just one of the many application or functions that run using blockchain technology. And uh, most of the cryptocurrencies such as Bitcoin, Ethereum are basically public blockchain. So this will answer the previous question that was addressed to uh, Renzo. So most of the cryptocurrencies are running on public blockchain. 
But however, there are cryptos uh, are run on the permission or private blockchain, such as you may have heard about uh, Facebook was considering coming out with a big uh, a cryptocurrency called the Libra. And also JP Morgan, uh, the financial American financial institutions will come up with their own coin called a JP Morgan coin. And also the central bank digital currency called CBDC, uh, which EU and most uh, some of the European co uh, countries and Canadian central banks or even China, sent, China Chinese government are some of the uh, uh, quite a few of the uh, nations are considering to uh, study and launch their own central bank digital currency CBDC, and, which is a form on the uh, based on the private blockchain. So. In a way, uh, Bitcoin represents one function among different cryptocurrencies, which is focused on money transfers. At the same time, uh, there are so many types of cryptocurrencies, actually everyone can come up with their own cryptocurrencies under certain uh, consensus or algorithms. It's just a matter of uh, whether there's a need for it. What's the functionality to attract the user of it? So crypto is just, can be regarded as one of the applications run on the blockchain. So there are some debates around Bitcoin and cryptocurrency. And I'll list some, some of them for both sides. Uh, the proponents view are mostly focused on the major benefit, such as decentralization, because it's not controlled by any government or nation state or individual. And ease of transfer, especially cross-border payments, is a lot faster compared to the traditional banking services. And anonymity and transparency. Uh, quite a few private cooperation, including investors like Elon Musk are a big fan of Bitcoins. Uh, Mr. Musk has invested about 1.5 billion US dollars into Bitcoin in this past February. And his company Tesla was thinking about to accept Bitcoin as a payment. So on the other side, uh, on the opposite side, the opponents also have some legitimate arguments. The first is the low scalability because resulting from the combination of high energy consumption and the low transaction rates due to the proof of work consensus and mining processes. So Bitcoin mining really consumes a lot of energy. It, uh, actually, it was estimated about 128.4 terawatt hour per year of energy was consumed by Bitcoin mining more than the entire country, such as Ukraine and Argentina. According to the Cambridge Bitcoin Electricity Consumption Index, uh, which is a project of the University of Cambridge. Cybersecurity is another concern. The main threats are its vulnerability in the mining process and transaction. The lack of security during the storage of the coins on online pools. Uh, there's some high profile security breaches result in in huge amount of Bitcoin being stolen back in 2013. A Bitcoin wallet service system was hacked. Uh, it lost about over 4,000 Bitcoins uh, that worth millions of dollars. The third is the price volatility and the lack of intrinsic value. Actually, the Bitcoin or any kind of a cryptocurrency so far right now, we, we, we can see them, we can also call them air coins because there's no real assets attached to or back, back up the cryptocurrency. So actually the Bitcoin can uh, have easily over 10% price swing in a single day, which we have witnessed during the past months. And this really been, the price has really been volatile. The last concern is about regulation. Uh, there's no clear regulation on the Bitcoin investment. 
from all major economies. For example, in the US, the CFTC, which is Commodity Futures Trading Commissions, treats Bitcoin as commodity. The IRS, which is the tax revenue services, treat Bitcoin as property. SEC, uh, which is Security Exchange Commission, as the former chairman Jay Clayton said, Bitcoin is not a security, but a payment mechanism. The insufficiency in current payment mechanism are major catalysts driving the rise of Bitcoin. So there is uh, no coercive, there's no cohesive regulation, uh, not alone, uh, not say within the single country among different departments, but across the board of uh, the global economy. So this will be a big issue. Right, and also uh, there's gonna be a lot of area to be improved for the future developments for the Bitcoin cryptocurrencies. So for most government, central bank and major global financial institutions, they are still watching the Bitcoin from the sideline with doubts. As former chairman of ECB, Mr. Uh, 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 yeah, former, Chairman of ECB, Mr. Mario Draghi said that he would not call Bitcoin a currency for a couple of reasons. One of them was that a euro today is a euro tomorrow. Its value is stable, but the value of Bitcoin really oscillates wildly. Isn't it a big problem for cryptocurrency like Bitcoin? How can we use them as currency if their value isn't stable? Uh, looking forward to the future of Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies, a cryptocurrency as payment mechanism is still developing with potential, uh, with potential to be far more disruptive. Uh, debates about future money is not about creation of new currency. It's about creating new methods to use existing currency and, and existing units of account. Cryptocurrency will evolve into more effective functional tools to improve efficiency of financial system and to improve financial inclusion and to promote financial inclusion. So uh, as, as I mentioned earlier, int by introducing different types of different functionality of cryptocurrencies, we can clearly see the path and the trend in the future from, from the original money transfer function and with with the add-on ability of smart contract and later on develop further into the interoperability, which is to communicate different among different cryptocurrencies. We can see each different cryptocurrency create its own ecosystem with their own sets of users. But currently there are lack of communication or, or interconnectivity between those uh, different cryptocurrencies, for example, uh, it's hard to communicate or transact to make transactions between Bitcoin and Ethereum's or between Ethereum's and Cardano's. So in the future, there will be more application or, or more cryptos with advanced functionalities to uh, improve the situations. So at last, on China's policy towards Bitcoin and cryptocurrency. Uh, Chinese government views virtual cryptocurrency as illegal since they're not issued by any recognized monetary institutions and they don't hold any legal status that can make them equivalent to money. And so the government advise against their circulation as a, as a currency. So in September 2017, Chinese regulator, regulatory authorities has, have, have imposed a ban on initial coin offering, which is ICO, uh, uh, a, coin, a, a cryptocurrency based fundraising process and term it illegal in China. And the further tightening of regulation came in February 2018 as China extended the ban to the operation and participation in any cryptocurrency exchange foreign or domestic. 
but China also, reason, also recently cracked down on cryptocurrency mining. So now I'll conclude my, my session and, and welcome if there's any question. Yeah, well, Brian, I have a, I have a, I have a question I want to, to pass it over to you. And the uh, question is, can you maybe explain what a smart contract is? Would you care about uh, digressing shortly and briefly on that? Uh, smart contract is basically in a nutshell, uh, a certain algorithm are been built. It's a pro it's basically a programming language that automatically, uh, execute a, with a preset algorithm and to execute a certain set of procedures, a predefined procedures, for example, like contracts. And, and, and different negotiation terms. So that's a very short and brief answer. Well, uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Brian. It's, uh, let me now just go back and regain possession of, uh, of the slides. Yeah, the, the, the smart contract, of course, it's something that is um, quite, uh, uh, quite, uh, quite an important element of the, Bitcoin of uh, Ethereum because they are connected to the to the crypto payments. So uh, basically, you have the formula of the buyer and seller of uh, or the provider of given services that are prefixed, preconditioned, and uh, on the on the on the occasion of uh, of uh, the com completion of uh, a given agreement, then automatically that uh, um, makes, for example, the payment uh, to become. To become payable, so it is, uh, it, and everything is done uh, uh, on uh, on on the basis of technology. Uh, so it makes it everything very very quick and very simple. Um, let me. Um, I'm trying to reconnect. Uh, okay, here we are. I am again in possession of the. Okay, uh, I, I start now an overview of the potentials of the, of the blockchain uh, technology. And um, here we're talking about applications of, uh, of, the, of, the, of the, the, the applications beyond the, the, the crypto. So now we're moving into applications uh, which go into uh, commerce, governance. And in fact, these are the, the, the main three segments that, that I would, that I have divided the utilization of the blockchain technology. And uh, I will just digress, uh, uh, we'll give you some, some example one by one on these uh, three categories. On the, on the financial side, well, you have uh, on, the, on the payments, uh, uh, the digital currencies, we already talked enough about that, but uh, um, the banks are utilizing the, the, the blockchain uh, a lot nowadays in order to, uh, to, to for, for clearance, uh, uh, for the more and more, Banking institutions are, are using this uh, blockchain-related uh, clearing system uh, from for, for the transactions, interbanking transactions. Uh, as an example, uh, in in Italy, there is the um, Italian Banking Association that they have uh, promoted. Uh, it's called the Spunto Banca. It's a, it is a distributed ledger technology which uh, allows the banks, uh, all the banks, all the Italian banks that are interconnected. Uh, utilizing this Spunto Banca system uh, via uh, blockchain technology that they can automatically uh, make clearance of uh, and settle the interbank transactions. Same thing, it, it is possible to, to be done on an international basis, international remittances and cross-border payments. Clearly, there is an issue about currencies uh, among European countries using, using the euro. This is much easier. Uh, it would be a bit more complicated and uh, I would say it's uh, the next uh, the next target, the next ambition would be to be uh, connected uh, to connecting Europe and China. Uh, but uh, I see that is not going to happen in the near future. In, the, in terms of financial services, the capital markets, you have a digital issuance of trading and settlements of security, very much uh, um, a, an important element. The supply chain financing, the train trade financing that you saw, mortgages, all the notarization services could be 
uh, overcome by by putting the all, all the mortgage contracts into a blockchain system by again uh, also um, also applying these uh, these contracts that we just mentioned before. Crowdfunding uh, the the ICO that uh, Brian just mentioned, uh, which was very sexy a couple of years ago, and now suddenly it's not as sexy as before because uh, clearly the whole system is not uh, so inducive and uh, it has been uh, kind of dropped uh, in, uh, for, for, for raising capital. Insurance, uh, especially for uh, the, the, the so-called property and casualty insurance for um, like uh, auto insurance for the simple claims and in combination with the smart contracts, uh, uh, it could have a, a big implication in reducing costs and having very quick validation of claims. Uh, the internal ledgers, it's um, quite uh, logical, I would say, because here you're talking about maybe large multinationals. They have uh, ledgers that have been spread in the different departments or subsidiaries or in different countries. And all this uh, could be compacted into a single ledger under the blockchain technology system. Uh, what is interesting now is uh, the uh, potential application in commerce. So in the trade and commerce, the supply chain management. So the management of inventory and uh, any, any disputes that could be, this, this has a, a number of applications. Uh, later on, I will present to you a case study, in fact, uh, related exactly on the supply chain, uh, supply chain management. Uh, then it's uh, another very important is the, the product provenance and the, the authenticity. Uh, for example, artwork, pharmaceuticals, etc. Another case study here uh, th that will be shown later on. A trade finance, uh, uh, the intellectual property re registration, and we know here in China how big how big of an issue the IP uh, is and uh, how important it could be to be able to establish and with the, 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 the attitude of the Chinese government nowadays to be so keen towards the blockchain utilization, it could be the right moment, the right uh, momentum, let's say, to, to force uh, the utilization of the blockchain system into registering intellectual property. It could uh, be a good safeguard for the interest of the European entities which have the, this property, and they're always scared of maybe of losing it or being copied uh, or what else can happen. So uh, this, uh, in, in my opinion, could be a very important area. Supply chain, again, in terms of uh, agriculture, well, wines, for example, the crops, et cetera, this, this is an area that uh, it, it could, be, could be exploded into many, many different applications in many ways. Uh, I don't have to tell you how important it would be to, to know exactly the provenance of a given wine or, 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 another, or another product. Um, I will, again, deliver a little bit more on, on this particular issue later on during the case studies. Uh, the safety net program related to delivery of seeds, fertilizers. Okay, you were talking about the same thing. Uh, I must make sure that uh, the origin of... Uh, uh, products that are so sensitive to either um, the 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 the, um, the powder and the 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 the, um, the uh, application of uh, of uh, of illegal activities uh, that could substantially modify the genetic value of uh, those products. Uh, uh, not to mention the medic medicines, the vaccination, the food. I mean, we're witnessing this nowadays. Uh, there has been recently, I read, I think on today on the newspaper, there have been discovered a number of COVID vaccines that have been tampered, that were, of course, illegal. And, and, and this, these are the problems of today. And in some way, I feel that the blockchain technology can be a contributor to uh, avoid for these things to, to happen and to make our life uh, uh, safer and to be able to also bring proper quality foods at the proper price uh, on the table of uh, all the human beings. Uh, the third and important area of application uh, is governance. Well, allow me here to say that this is, uh, um, could be a game changer from uh, many aspects. 
because uh, uh, you can put everything online. Uh, you can have your digital identity, your e-residence, uh, your records of birth, marriage, death certificates, your CVs, your past uh, you know, working experience references, so on and so forth. Everything can be uh, put online, can be, can be digitized, and can be uploaded on a block. Um, in terms of uh, governance, e-voting, well, wouldn't you love to have seen e-voting system uh, on, a, on a blockchain in the recent American elections? I think I would have loved, honestly, I, we would have saved ourselves of this charade of uh, back and forth and uh, who, we, who won and who lost. Um, E-voting is, by the way, something that it was uh, experimented on a test base uh, in, uh, I think it was uh, in, one, in uh, West Virginia, I think it was back in 2018 on a midterm election. And uh, they run a, a, a test uh, using the e-voting system. With, how would this work? Well, it wouldn't be very simple. Each, uh, each uh, eligible voter will be given a token and uh, the token then you would be able to use it by assigning the token to your preferred candidate. Uh, that would leave tracks, would leave the, 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 the breadcrumbs uh, on saying whom was uh, you, you voted for and so on and so forth. So in that case, uh, uh, it would be an extremely beneficial ad, uh, advantage for clarity. Uh, government record keeping, criminal records, nobody could tamper with them. Um, how many times have we seen some, uh, uh, some, 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 some people that have been in the, in, the, in the criminal gangs that have been able to simply their, their past criminal records vanished and, and never seen again. So this, uh, the, uh, putting everything on a blockchain would secure that uh, whatever has been uploaded on the chain, there it is and there stays. Well, tax, yeah, tax fraud. Well, you name it. I mean, that uh, we've been reading on the newspaper, I wouldn't say daily, but uh, very often cases. And uh, also there, if uh, you put everything on a, on a chain, on a blockchain, uh, then your tax record is there and you can always uh, have access to it if you have clearly the key to have the access to that particular information. Uh, protection of critical infrastructure against uh, cyber attacks. Nowadays, uh, more than ever, a key element of uh, importance and interest. Healthcare is uh, electronic medical records. Um, it's, this this it could be extremely important and vital for the doctors, for medical um, um, people that have to maybe know a better and have a better understanding of people that uh, maybe they lost a memory or people that suddenly has, uh, are unconscious because of an accident. Um, if the doctor could have quickly access uh, to all the medical record in one in one chip in one uh, in one area of, of information that would be uh, very beneficial and it could also save lives um, ownership registers well here basically i i even had my own conflict uh, many years ago because i'm old enough to tell you stories where computers were not existing yet so um, land land registries uh, property titles, um, it, it can happen that you have so many disputes because errors, omissions in the registration, in the, in the property books in uh, municipalities or local offices can happen and, and has happened and will continue to happen. Uh, one solution, in fact, could be to put, to upload all those information, create a historical uh, a link a historical string of blocks chained with their own with their own time ledgers and so on and of course i put etc because uh, because there are there are a lot of other potential applications that are there that are uh, that are so vital uh, that could be so vital for our everyday life now the question probably comes to why why doesn't that happen well, uh, let me put it uh, in addition to the cost, of course, of uh, structuring this thing, which is not 
it's not, it's not the easiest thing to do. But it's also, don't, don't forget that anyone that enters into this system is just like a stripping, stripping yourself naked. You are there, you, you are who you are. And, and, you, and, 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 and you provide the information of uh, everything that you have. So um, when, you, when you enter into this kind of, uh, of, of a system, especially in, uh, you know, in a supply chain concept, uh, then you you basically tell that uh, this is how, what you produce, this is how much you produce, this is the area you produce it uh, from this day to this day. You had your harvest, uh, and uh, those processes uh, took you so much time, etc., etc., etc. So all this is visible by, of course, all the all the ones that are allowed to visit, allowed to see it, but they are all visible. Not everybody, and not all the time everybody is ready to strip, strip themselves naked and be able to be seen uh, in all different areas of their activity. So um, I complete here my quick flash on the applications beyond Bitcoin and cryptos, but as I anticipated during this uh, short period, uh, we will continue and we will bring to you examples, we will to bring to you case studies on uh, on the module six later on. So uh, back to you, Brian. Uh, and as before, if there are questions, I'm ready and willing to answer. Yes, Renzo. Actually, there are uh, two quick questions coming up from one of the uh, audience. Uh, I'll just give you a quick heads up on them. The first yes. one is uh, the question that smart contract are an old concept before cryptocurrency emerges. So many concepts blockchain included have rooted before Bitcoin era. Why, the question is why the hesitation to adopt new financial technology and why lack of regulatory system? So uh, we will give us some thoughts and we can both contribute to the question. Uh, it may be a you little can, bit more You can complex. go ahead. Yeah, yeah, you can go ahead. And my, my first thought, uh, why lack of regulatory systems uh, and also, first, I think the phenomenon of Bitcoin, especially with this blockchain concept, uh, is really depending on the development of the overall technology, especially the, in the development of internet and the digital economy, and also especially with the, uh, with the 5G process, uh, because many people consider the blockchain is the second layer or the advanced version, the 2.0 version of the internet. So that's why uh, uh, I think there's not enough cases out there or practical applications out there to, for any regulators to regulate because the market is so small and it's uh, regulators see it's insignificant. So they, they often ignore this kind of a small fragments of the market that won't make any dent on the overall economy at the first place. So that will be my quick answer to this question. And also the hesitation to new technology. I, I think this is always uh, happened throughout the human history uh, because nobody wants to be the guinea pig and everybody wants to see the way out, uh, how things are play out, and then later on jump onto the bandwagon. So that's my quick answer. Uh, feel free to jump in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I, I cannot but agree with your with your um, with your with, with your assumptions. Uh, the The point is that uh, anything that is uh, brand new and it is coming new, um, and especially in this case, uh, the concept of a blockchain was modeled to launch a, a, a breakthrough currency. And let's not forget that that happened during the financial crisis and it was not a, not a casualty that, I mean, it was not by accident that uh, this came up uh, during that period because it, it, during that period, there was a total um, sort of disappointment and uh, mistrust on the whole system, the whole, um, gold, gold supply, uh, gold uh, based system, the 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 dollar denominated, the do dollar dominated uh, international market, 
so it it was something that was very very much focused on that and uh, the the application of blockchain then to other activity to other to other modes to other systems uh, became a bit more uh, clear to everybody uh, at a later stage when uh, when when things were um, were were already uh, were, were, were were giving an opportunity to see that uh, there was something beyond the cryptocurrency. There was uh, something that uh, this concept of uh, storing information and uh, and casting this information without the possibility of changing them again um, was uh, was something that could have been beneficial. But what I said at the end of my presentation is let's not forget this is. Uh, uh, something that uh, draws back people. Um, we had an experience in in testing this uh, on a blockchain system in uh, in, a, in a in a let's say we was a unicorn condition uh, in Europe a couple of years ago, and the, the major drawback was in fact that people were not ready to open up to uh, to make transparent information available to to everybody. So uh, sometimes um, the the technology could be uh, super duper, could be absolutely fantastic, uh, top notch. But there may be other situations which make it uh, not uh, uh, take off as quickly as initially expected. And let's also not forget that the cost inherited inherent in this uh, in this application at the beginning were quite high. Uh, these costs are slowly are are coming down. Uh, and uh, that's why also I feel quite optimistic about uh, the future uh, and the future opportunities of utilization of blockchains in other areas uh, aside from the from the cryptocurrencies. Um, I think that uh, um, I don't want to spend too much time because uh, otherwise we may be running late in our presentation. So I will quickly uh, give the floor then to you, Brian, and sure. uh, we will keep those questions uh, towards the end. And as I okay. said, if we if we cannot answer all uh, during today's session, we will be addressing one by one, uh, and uh, and especially if we have not been able to answer them as we progress uh, in the presentation. So um, I give the microphone back to you, Brian. Okay, thank you, Renzo. All right, I will move on to the next section, uh, which is the current development uh, of blockchain in China. Uh, China's national policy uh, towards blockchain. Uh, it's uh, China's really committed towards the blockchain technology. Uh, Chinese President Xi Jinping gave a speech in October 2019 saying that China needs to seize the opportunity presented by blockchain in what appears to be one of the first instances instance of a major world leader backing the technology. Uh, the Chinese government has emphasized the distinction between cryptocurrency and blockchain. Users are warned not to conflate the two and reminded that the development of blockchain application, not the cryptocurrency, is widely encouraged. Uh, the Chinese government recognizes the unique potential of blockchain technology. Uh, the government and Chinese corporations have invested heavily in blockchain tech in blockchain development. Uh, China is quiet, quietly building a complete blockchain ecosystem to support and supply the coming techno-economic revolutions of distributed ledger technology. A, a recent special feature on state-run television has stated that blockchain will be the infrastructure for the future global economy. Uh, the television, the televised program claim that the blockchain is 10 times more valuable than internet. The fact that party officials are using the state media to inform the public about blockchain indicates that China expects blockchain to play a major role in the country's future. In April 2020, China's Ministry of Industry and Information Technology announced a new national blockchain committee that brings together experts from government, think tanks, university, and technology companies to help set standards for using the technology across industries. The committee includes several China's tech giants, including Ant Group, 
Baidu, JD.com, Tencent, Tencent Holding, uh, and Huawei. Now, some of these companies have already been looking into blockchain for years. Uh, there are different uh, programs uh, uh, implemented or executed in the local and provincial level. So for, for instance, for Hainan province, Hainan province uh, released, released a set of measures to speed up the development of blockchain industry in December, 2019. The measures released by China's first blockchain pilot zone in the Hainan pilot free trade zone, the FTZ, will support the blockchain industry through talent cultivation, techno technological application, social investment, and other aspects. A base in the Hainan resort software community uh, the, called RSC, an internet industrial park, the blockchain pilot zone was launched by the Provincial Department of Industry and Information Technology in October 2018. It is the first official authorized blockchain pilot zone in China. The RSC also launched an, uh, an action plan titled called a Secure Sharing Compliance Plus, in short for SSC Plus on the same day, uh, which is aimed to realize uh, realizing uh, secure and trusted data sharing and digital governance by integrating advanced technology including blockchain technology and big data the ministry of industry and information technology has also issued the implementation plan to support hainan with the construction of a pilot ftz free trade zone and a free trade port with Chinese characteristics, uh, which covers 17 specific areas, including development of the blockchain industry. In Sichuan province, uh, during the 2020 Chengdu Global Innovation and Entrepreneurship Fair, the secretary of the party group of the Chengdu New Economy Committee uh, published the Chengdu Blockchain Application Scenario Supply Action Plan, in short, action plan, uh, which state that the city aims to adopt blockchain technology for various use cases. According to the action plan, authorities of Chengdu plans to adopt blockchain for multiple use cases, including urban governance, cross-border trade, smart manufacturing, smart education, smart healthcare, financial service, intellectual property. As part of this initiative, authorities plans to shape around two to three blockchain cluster creation areas over the next two years in order to build Chengdu into a pioneering city for blockchain development. Uh, there are public and private blockchain projects going, up, going in parallel in China, the Greater Bay Area Trade Finance Blockchain Platform, which was launched in 2018. The platform facilitates receivable financings and information verification for cross-border business and is now used by commercial banks and safe bureaus in 19 provinces and cities across China. Another major project launched by the Chinese government is the blockchain-based cross-border financing platform implemented by SAFE, uh, which is the State Administration of Foreign Exchange back in March 2019. The People's Bank of China has a blockchain-based digital currency under development called a DCEP. It's called a Digital Currency Electronic Payment. If implemented, uh, Chinese fiat currency would rely on blockchain ledgers for interbank transfers and transactions. Uh, other governmental projects, including smart contract applications, uh, the Hangzhou Internet Court 
that assist automation of contracts execution and smart adjudication of cases and, and identify uh, uh, an identification platform in Shenzhen that automates identity verification of users of government services uh, and a, a logistic platform introduced by the custom of Tianjin province that facilitates cross-board transactions and payments. Also major corporations are interested in blockchain and investing heavily. Alibaba, China's second largest company filed 43 international patents for various blockchain technology over the course of uh, 2017, the most of any company in the world. JD.com, China's largest online retailer, is already using blockchain in its supply chain for food product. Blockchain token allowed JD.com to track individual items from production facilities to warehouse to warehouse customers doorstep in one integrated system. Uh, Tencent, China's largest company and the fifth largest company in the world, recently began blockchain R&D and published a white paper early in 2019 on the, implement, on the implementation of an open trusted database for goods and logistic management to prevent tampering with initial application in prescription drugs. Uh, China's national blockchain project into the future. Uh, blockchain service network, in short called BSN in 2020. An ambitious government backed blockchain infrastructure network launched in China. The blockchain based service network, uh, the BSN act as an operating system but blockchain programs. So developers won't have to design a framework from the ground up. Importantly, it is part of country's goal to set industry standards and build underlying and build up the underlying infrastructure for blockchain applications worldwide. The brain behind the BSN, the BSN are the uh, State Information Center, uh, which is affiliate to China's top economic and reform planner, the country's credit card processing giants, Union Pay, and telecom carrier. China Mobile and a Beijing based startup called the Red Date Technology, who created the techno technical strategy and architected the BSN. BSN, uh, the blockchain service network, is designed to unify the fragmented market. It is a cross, it is a cross cloud, cross portal, and cross framework public network that enable, developer, enable developers to easily and affordably develop, deploy, operate, and maintain permissioned and permissionless blockchain application and nodes. The BSN itself is not, actually is not a blockchain protocol, rather it is a centralized platform that has done the heavy lifting for developers so they can plug in and code choosing from several enterprises, blockchain protocols, or public chains. The goal is to reduce their operational costs, improve flexibility, and provide better regulatory oversight, according to the white paper. Uh, one of the network's advantages for BSN is its low price, uh, which makes it accessible to a wide range of users. Uh, it will encourage a vast number of small and medium-sized enterprises and individuals, including students, to use the BSN to invent and innovate, thereby uh, accelerate the rapid development and widespread use of blockchain technology. The second part of the configuration and modification of several enterprises uh, blockchain protocol uh, is to to fit uh, the uniform standards. 
So the top-down approach enabled China to build a large-scale network quickly while avoiding regulatory red tapes. So this is uh, this will be the conclusion for this section. Uh, if there's any questions, I will be like to give some feedback. Yeah. Um, yes, Brian. I have uh, several questions here. I'm okay. trying to to pick some that um, um, could be interesting uh, because, like the. We're talking about 5G here. This is a question about the 5G yeah. being an advantage for peer-to-peer -peer communication, but uh, cloud security and infrastructure, uh, don't you think it's a tremendous issue to be solved? So uh, this, this, uh, the, the, this cloud security and infrastructure, you think that that could be, could be something that uh, would be difficult to be solved? Uh, 5G. I think this is a little bit more technical. Uh, I think um, the in, in a general sense, uh, the security issues among different nodes. Uh, actually, it, it's it's a, it's a basically a different layer of securities. The first, the ground layer of security is between the different computers, and then they move up. To different systems, and then later on, eventually move up to the cloud level. It, cloud level. That's is the top level of security. I assume in within each of those dimensions, we call it, or within each levels, new technology, new protocol will be further developed to implement and to uh, to make more uh, advancement in terms of providing securities on each level. And the five G is definitely the 5G technology would definitely help and and the promote uh, to make the peer to peer communication much easier and much more faster that's for sure and even maybe the 6G's will be down the line in the future who knows i mean 5G <laughs> might be uh, outdated in the in about a year or two right sure <laughs> uh, yeah here uh, they're talking about uh, the difference between blockchain and ripple um, would you yeah, I can Would I can pick care? up a little bit. Okay, sure. maybe you can. Yeah, I'll give a little uh, quick description mm -hmm. on Ripple. Uh, so basically, yeah. Ripple is uh, a network that something is like between public and private blockchain. It's it's permissioned, um, permissionless blockchain. Uh, Ripple is the name of the company and the network be behind the cryptocurrency. The cryptocurrency associated with Ripple called XRP. But uh, beyond the cryptocurrency, uh, Ripple is better known as a payment settlement, asset, ex asset exchange, and remittance systems that works similar to SWIFT, uh, which is a service for international money and security transfer that is used by a network of banks and financial intermediaries. So that is a quick answer for, for that question. So if uh, there, if, if there's need to be further discussion, we can probably do it in a later time. Sure, 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 sure. Well, you know, we, we have, of course, uh, the references of all the, the questions that are coming. So I'm sure that we can further digress um, later on or separately um, tomorrow or another day. So we will see uh, how we progress uh, on this uh, presentation today. Uh, considering the time that we are making, I think that we're pretty much on time. Um, I may suggest that we take a, a, just a five minute break for, you know, just a, you can call it a coffee break, could be physiological great blame break. Uh, so let's say that we will reconvene at, uh, this would be 3.45 uh, Brussels time, which is uh, 10.45 PM for me. And it will be what, 6.45 for you, Brian. Yeah, actually, it's it's six forty here. <laughs> okay, six. Uh, no, we'll, no, but we will reconvene. We will reconvene oh, sure, yeah. at six forty-five. Okay, definitely. So at six forty-five, okay. we're we're back here. All right, we'll do. Okay.
Okay, I'm back. So I'll move on to the next section, uh, yes. which is, yep. Okay. All right, which is the outlook on the future of blockchain. Uh, blockchain is as significant and disruptive as the internet, uh, which has rapidly changed our economy and our lives. It is one popular saying as followed, the internet solved the problem of information transmission. Therefore, it can be called the internet of information. On the other hand, a blockchain solved the problems of value exchange and that and then it can be called the internet of value. So there are some common consensus been made on the impact, on the total impact of blockchain. The first, the blockchain is a transformative technology that can rapidly, that could rapidly change how business and government interact. A blockchain must be open to encourage broad adoption, innovation, and interoperability. A blockchain is ready for business and government use today. So there are five trends in the near future that predicted by the IBM blockchain team. First, uh, pragmatic governance model will emerge. So started in 2020, we will expect new governance models that enable large and diverse consortia to approach decision-making, permissioning schemes, and even payment more efficiently. Uh, this model will help to standardize information from different sources and capture new and more robust data sets. 68% of CTOs and CIOs even expect to set a scalable governance model for interactions across multiple blockchain networks to be an important feature of the organization's blockchain environment in the next one to three years. Uh, the next is interconnectivity comes one step closer to reality. So uh, through reaching interconnectivity, uh, although reaching interconnectivity at a maximized level might be years away, but, uh, and the definition of interoperability can take many forms. We find that 83% of organizations today believes assurance of governance and assurance of governance and standards that allow interconnectivity and interoperability among permissioned and permissionless blockchain networks to be an important factor to join to join the industry-wide blockchain network was more than one first believing it is to be essential. The third is uh, adjacent technology will combine the blockchain to create an, to create a next level advantage. So combine, combining adjacent technology, which is include uh, artificial intelligence, AI, the cloud computing, big data, and IoT, internet of things, also digitization, so combining all these technology with blockchain will help us to do things that haven't been done before. More trustworthy data from the blockchain will better inform and strengthen underlying algorithm. The blockchain will help keep the data secure and audit each and every steps in, in the decision-making process, uh, enabling sharper insights driven by data that network participants trust. Uh, validation tools will begin to, to combat fraudulent data sources with a need for heightened data protection mechanism. This year, blockchain solutions will use validation tools along with crypto anchors, IoT beacons, and oracles, mechanisms that link digital assets to the physical world by injecting outside data into networks this will improve trust and remove dependency on human data entry, which is often prone to error and fraud. And last, the central bank will expand into wholesale and retail 
CBDCs, which is central bank digital currencies, uh, with countries in Asia, the Middle East, and the Caribbean beginning to experiment with CBDC in real times. Uh, there is no doubt there there will continue. They will continue to gain momentum in the new years and and redefine payments in several ways. For one, CBDC will see continued expansion in wholesale uh, with some initial foray in retail CBDC as well. Moreover, there will be increased interest in tokenization and digitization of other types of assets and securities, such as central bond debentures for treasury bonds. Uh, the pro blockchain The pro blockchain less cryptocurrency policy of China will likely to persist in the future. While two areas of the future blockchain development in China are particularly worth following. And the first is the, uh, the China National Digital Currency, DCEP, uh, which is Digital Currency Electronic Payment. DCEP uh, will be built with blockchain and crypto technology. Uh, this revolutionary cryptocurrency can become the world's first central bank digital currency as it is issued by the State Bank People's Bank of China, PBOC. The goal and objectives of the currency are to increase the circulation of RMB and its international reach, with eventual hopes that RMB will be a global currency like the US dollar. DCP testing on the general public uh, in, cities of, in cities of Shenzhen and Suzhou. Hong Kong will participate in cross-border DCP testing. And China Construction Bank already launched the DCP wallet. Tencent to be a major partner of DCP in its distribution and utilization. The further development of BSN uh, the blockchain service network was focused on low cost yeah the further development of BSN was uh, uh, was focused on low cost interconnectivity and interoperability China's new infrastructure national initiative makes blockchain an integral part of the country's digital infrastructure. Uh, BSN was launched for the domestic commercial use and globally on April 25th, 2020. If it works as, con if it works as envisioned, the companies and software developers will be able to plug in the BSN and build blockchain-based applications as easily as assembling the Lego set. There are two versions of BSNs. One is called the uh, BSN China, and the other is BSN International. Uh, BSN is still one network, but, uh, but the government is divided between the BSN China and the BSN International. Uh, the BSN China only utilizes permissioned private blockchain network, while uh, BSN International incorporates permissionless public blockchains. BSN will incorporate two public protocols like Ethereum's and EOS uh, for their distinct utility functionality, uh, such as smart contract and the uh, uh, industrial scalability. BSN recently announced that it will support uh, it will it will support Quorum Enterprise Blockchain, uh, which is a permission blockchain developed by JP Morgan to process private banking transactions. A BSN has also revealed a plan to integrate the permission version of Cosmos uh, with, with this crypto called ATM, ATOM, Atoms, into the platform. The Cosmo is, aims to become the internet of blockchains, which is going to solve the problems of interoperability once and for all. So in conclusion, 
blockchain-enabled business models will present a seismic shift to how businesses conduct in the future. Its impact on commerce will be game-changing, especially given the in increasingly digital global economy and the decentralization of business model and stakeholders enabled by blockchain. Today, uh, the, the boundary of commerce are once again being pushed and the role of internet as intermediaries is changing given blockchain technology. For European SMEs entering China, given the growing, given the growing importance of blockchain in China, uh, maybe you should consider some of the following factors. Uh, first is try to digitize your business process or your product in every possible way. And the second is to create, try to create a supply chain ledgers by choosing the proper blockchain platform with smart contract capability for your business and product. And last, depending on the nature of the business and, and your business model, uh, try to authenticate your business by tokenizing your product and then present them through, uh, present them in a, in a digital package and promote them in China. So this will conclude uh, my section and I'm welcome for if there's any questions. Uh, Brian, here I have yeah. a tricky, I have a tricky one for you because uh, I okay. mean, you, you're, you're Chinese, you're born in Beijing. So uh, this one, I think that you are the best one to be able to answer this. The question is, uh, how does the Chinese government reconcile the exclusiveness of permissioned and private blockchains with its tendency to control information flows? Ha, huh. <laughs> that's an interesting <laughs> one. And I think uh, there's, there's a balance between uh, in the art, uh, it's an art of control or governance. So it's the same thing applied to technology. So in terms of the information flow and the control between the permission and the permissionless uh, blockchain, so there, I think there are, I, I, my, my instant reflection is, is just like, uh, as the relationship between democracy, freedom, and the rules of laws and discipline. So how we enforce uh, a certain rule to the society while giving a certain liberty and a freedom for let individual and in society to grow, it's, it's an ultimate debate amounts throughout human history and civilization. So there's no ex exception for this information of blockchain and the era of digital economy. So there's always pros and cons to debate about uh, privacy, uh, individual liberty versus control and, and, and surveillance. So the more we get into the digitized economy, including with the utilizing of blockchain mentioned, uh, Renzo, you probably mentioned earlier during your sections about how we, how do we balance uh, uh, this, the privacy issue versus security. So this is the ultimate test for any uh, government uh, uh, across, across the nation, across the different political system. So I'll say this, there will not, there will not be a perfect answer regardless for China or for the Western society, uh, US or European countries. I mean, uh, there, there's a, it's always a dynamic situation. It's a fluid situation and try to find out the perfect balance in between. Uh, in terms yeah, of, um, yeah, in terms yeah, of technology, um, there, will yeah. be, there will be certain uh, applications or fun functionalities to to develop on either side of it, control versus freedom. So just like the decentralization of the blockchain versus later on blockchain would develop more from a public from a public framework into a more private framework. So there's always balance in between. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, and and I would like to add to play a little bit the devil's advocate and saying, you know, how can we be sure that in China, Big Brother will not actually be able to tamper into even into a blockchain system and, and being able to, to actually, uh, you know, modify or, or, or change 
uh, even something that uh, supposedly is uh, unchangeable, that cannot be manipulated, cannot be um, cannot be changed. So um, I think the question and the, the still the, the question mark uh, still lingers there, and in, in some way also answers the one of the previous questions about why blockchain technologies has not picked up at the level that it could. Uh, I think that there is a, still a sort of a cloud of uh, skepticism lingering around uh, about uh, how actually how uh, how safe uh, all this information is and how uh, they in fact uh, will not be able to be tampered by whatever. Uh, so, uh, but in uh, from from my perception, I I tend to agree with your uh, with your assessment. Uh, which uh, is a bit uh, China is a bit uh, uh, putting feet on 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 two sides, and and trying to balance this uh, between uh, a very centralistic, very authoritarian government on one side, and uh, trying to open up and trying to modernize its society, knowing that uh, modernizing society means that you're opening up information, internet, uh, uh, data, the data flow. So it's it's difficult to, to curb all this uh, development or all these uh, uh, pushes for m modernization. So I think it's going to be it's going to be a, an interesting evolution over the next years, especially considering that uh, there is a, a clear indication from the government, from the central government, that, that they want to push the blockchain system. I think they want to use it in order to make sure to, to guarantee better security internally. Uh, within uh, probably within scope and within limits, we will see how this thing is going to to develop over time. Uh, but clearly, it's a, it's an interesting it's an interesting uh, uh, point. In fact, uh, uh, it, the, the 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 further response from the same person that asked the question was it looks like uh, we have a blockchain with the Chinese characteristics. And in fact, uh, I think you. Yes. Um, Eric, uh, you have it. Uh, you 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 right right on the right on the money with uh, with your comment. And uh, as everything else in China, it is uh, evolution, uh, change, modernization with uh, its Chinese characteristics. Uh, as we know, the sessions of the the Chinese Parliament uh, is going to start uh, from tomorrow, and then we're going to have the new five year plan being uh, being uh, promoted and presented officially. Uh, and this is going to be again. It's the 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 the, the new the new Chinese system with uh, Chinese characteristics uh, that is going to be paving the future development of the country. Uh, with uh, with this, this is the, the the let's say the part that we were try that we tried to present the blockchain, its uh, its concept, its evolution, its ap the, its applications. Uh, the um, the kind of um, potential that this can have vis-a-vis -vis, uh, China, from my point of view, there is a, a great potential in terms of um, especially commerce and trade between China and Europe. And in this respect, uh, I would like to present the first case, uh, and I would like to move on the first case, but I need to repossess myself with the uh, with the PPT. Uh, sorry, but uh, I, I messed it up. I cannot find it. Um, Brian, could you could you uh, take back the screen, please? Brian? Okay. Yeah, there you go. Okay. Can we can you go on the on the first? Yeah, this is the first one. Okay. Let me try now to let's see if I can do this again. No, nope, I simply I cannot do it. So uh, okay. I will ask I will yeah. ask you to I will ask you to to sure. to do that to do that for me. Yeah, I'll do it. If I can. You. Okay. 
So uh, the first the first case is um, the first case is uh, is running on uh, authenticity. Uh, so from authenticity to tokenization of uh, uh, of artwork. So here uh, it's the in, the interesting part is uh, the possibility to um, could you go back to the PPT mode, please? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So go on. So can you click on the next one? So I'm introducing you to uh, Leonardo, which is uh, the concept is to have here a digitized uh, artwork. Uh, of course, in this case, Leonardo. Okay, stop, stop there, uh, Brian. Okay. Uh, so uh, Leonardo is a clearly fictitious uh, uh, st statute, uh, but it can be uh, any any work of art. And uh, in this case, Leonardo is uh, we want to bring Leonardo on the blockchain in order to make sure that we have the authenticity and that we can prove the authenticity of this artwork. The first thing we do is to we digitize Leonardo. We take a 3D scan. We take all the characteristics, the ownership, the location, latest evaluation, all the other valuable information that uh, are important to be put on the on the ledger. So then this uh, ledger is uh, uploaded on on the block, and uh, together with its hash and the timestamp. You remember from the beginning of my presentation that these are essential elements that must be included in the block. This being the first block is called the Genesis block. Out of curiosity, Genesis block is for any kind of blockchain system. I mean, Bitcoin had its Genesis block way back in 2009. And by now, uh, as far as I understand it, so uh, we're running at about 700,000 blocks that have been added to the Genesis block in Bitcoin, uh, which uh, determines the height of the blockchain. So in this case, as we already understood, all this information is a channel to the nodes and the nodes are interconnected. So um, this, here is, uh, of course, it's a, it's a theoretical case that I put, but the actual implementation of this process has been done. It has been done by a company, and I will let a short video run, uh, which explains what this company is doing and what they have done and what it is doing. So, um, Brian, can you please click forward and then, okay, and then click to, to let the video run. So perhaps Brian needs to open his uh, microphone for the audio, if there is any audio. Need to open the microphone. Can we, can we make the audio um, to be heard? Or? Can, you, can you hear it? Yeah, I, I can hear you, but I cannot hear the audio. Oh, you cannot hear the audio. Brian, if I may, actually, what you should do now is to stop sharing and then share again. But when you share again, you also have to click on share the audio, the sound of my computer. Okay. So you want me to uh, stop sharing first, right? Yeah, exactly. And I'll okay. click again on share. Okay. You click on the presentation and before. I see.
Our artistic and cultural heritage is oh, huge no. as its yes, value. Yes. Monitoring all artworks and archaeological finds requires a titanic effort. Now you can hear it, But right? it is necessary to preserve the treasures of mankind history. Checkups required many resources in terms of technical skills, time and money. Our research has also revealed two main problems with condition reporting. A low grade standardization and a high level of dependency from the experts that make it. That's why it would be useful to develop a scalable and effective solution to allow a wider activity of checkup and, thanks to the available technologies, to concentrate experts' attention on main problems. Brian Jane uses blockchain technologies to meet specific requirements of the art field, mainly related to the opportunity on authorizing some data and make them partially available in public. Our algorithm will normalize all UVIs through a quality score that will depend on a rating of the 3D image quality, certificates and credential of the subject. For example, a higher score for a museum and a lower one for an unknown owner. Our AI-based algorithm will allow us to match the 3D images inside the platform, recognize the possible fakes or, in case of thefts, when recovered by the authorities, will permit to return the work of art to the owners in a short time. 3D scanning, blockchain and artificial intelligence technologies create the basis to develop an objective condition reported to support the digitization, restoration and maintenance processes of cultural heritage. Arayun Chain. Okay. Uh, okay. Click to the next one. This, uh, as you can, as you have seen, if you witnessed, uh, is a, a system to uh, to actually to authenticate uh, an artwork, a piece of art. But I want to take you one step further. I want to move in from uh, the authentication of the artwork into uh, to the uh, tokenization. Uh, Please, uh, Brian, just move forward, please. Okay. Just, just, just move forward. Don't, don't fiddle too much with that. Okay. Uh, so after, so yes, now this yes. is- Yes, yeah. the next one, next one. Okay. Click, click the next one, click, click again. Okay, here we are. Okay. So um, in, in this case, uh, um, please click one more time. Yeah. So the Chinese are very fond of European artwork. And uh, in this case, what we're trying to do is uh, we take Leonardo and uh, uh, artwork added uh, on, the, on, on the blockchain and uh, generated the collection of real assets. And these real assets are given an economic value. And then the economic value of the assets is uh, securitized and converted into art tokens. The next step then, uh, the uh, move one more time then art tokens are placed on a new public permission blockchain and traded within the permission nodes utilizing smart contracts. Every node will have continued tracking of the value of the assets and the physical condition of the assets. So as you can see from, from, from this uh, simulation, what we're moving, we're moving from uh, the, uh, the, 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 the asset that has been uh, all, it has been monitored and has been uh, in included all the data and authenticated. Now we want to transform that real asset and become tradable. So uh, we move from the real asset value into a tokenized value and the, which token then can be traded online. Here, uh, what you see on the cloud on the left is uh, I put this uh, non-fungible tokens, the, the NFT, which is a, a brand new uh, interpretation. The, the, the non-fungible uh, tokens are unique uh, cryptocurrency tokens used to, to represent assets. And in this case, the asset is a digital work of art. NFTs uh, uh, can be bought and sold, but since they run on blockchain, ownership and validity of the asset that they represent can be tracked. So when an artist uh, puts up uh, for sale an NFT denominated artwork, the buyer would purchase a unique token that represents the asset and uh, can then uh, prove authenticity and ownership of the digi digital or real artwork through blockchain. What is, uh, what, as, as, as a side, uh, out of curiosity, let me put it this way, 
there is a phenomenon currently happening as we speak as uh, um, there is a, a very famous uh, artist, a digital artist by the name of Mike Winkleman. He's also known as Beeple. And uh, he has been uh, producing uh, digital artwork on computer, of course, for several years now. What is happening is that uh, his latest work of art titled Every Day's The First 5,000 Days is being auctioned uh, at Christie's. And uh, Christie's is uh, running this auction as we speak because the auction started on February 25th and it will end on March 11th. So uh, if any one of you is interested, you can Google or you can enter on Christie's uh, website and uh, you can place your bet. Uh, I believe that I will not attend because uh, I suppose that this uh, piece of art will run in uh, about six digits so, and could be running close to 200 to 300,000 euros for this work of art. And what is this work of art? It's a, basically, it's a collection of uh, pictures that uh, uh, people took over 14 years, over 5,000 days, which is almost 14 years. And uh, if for each, and he made a patchwork of all these uh, pictures and produced this uh, digitized work of art. So the auction is there, it is running, and it's gonna be very interesting to see how it's going to end. So um, here in this uh, first case study, we, we saw the uh, one reality uh, that is allowing to evaluate and to uh, digitize a work of art. And uh, I'm also going one, one step forward by promoting the possibility for this work of art to be traded because uh, uh, why I make the comment uh, here on the top right side uh, is because I feel that the, the Chinese are very fond of uh, European artwork and, uh, and that they would be probably considering to, to buy some uh, piece of art as long as they know that there is, it is authentic that there is uh, no, there are no, they're buying no fakes. So the authentication part would be extremely important for any trade with any uh, Chinese trader. Uh, the to tokenization of it uh, would make the trade more feasible and, and smoother and most importantly, safer. So uh, this is my part for the first case. And I leave to Brian to present it to you the second case. So Brian, I leave it to you now. Okay, Renzo. Uh, here, I, I have a case in China uh, involved the, uh, the supply chain financing for auto industry. So this, uh, this platform of uh, blockchain based supply chain financing platform uh, was, was cr originally created from a, from a consortium of universities and private enterprises. And uh, uh, it's as the first blockchain, blockchain driven supply chain financing application uh, for auto retail industry in China, uh, we call this plat we call this uh, the, the BC Auto SF SCF, uh, which is called it a platform. Uh, the platform is designed to address those pain points uh, existed in traditional supply chain finance and propose the innovative blockchain design to reshape the business logic and to develop an efficient and reliable financing platform for SME in the auto retail industry to decrease the cost of financing and to speed up the cash flow. So currently there are over 600 active enterprises using this uh, platform to run their financing business. Uh, up until October, 2019, the platform provides services to 450 online and offline auto retailers and three B2B asset exchange platforms, nine fund providers, 
and uh, 78 logistic service across 21 provinces in China. There are close to 3,300 financing transactions successfully completed on this platform. And the amount of financing is well over uh, 500 million RMB. So for the auto industry, uh, the participants in, this, in the supply chain, such as manufacturer, supplier, carrier, warehouse, terminal buyers, and funding providers. So they all sort of have limited peer-to-peer -peer communication with regards to their own concerns in trading settings. So one of the big, biggest hurdle in information exchange is the trust. So in addition, there are high risk of tempering uh, while involving in debt notes, contracts, warehouse receipts. Actually, in a centralized information environment, it is easy to temper a record. Moreover, uh, it is costly to perform efficient custody, especially difficult to verify authenticity of an invoice or receivable. So this blockchain platform aims to ensure the trust among participants and reduce the financing costs for the auto retailer industry. Uh, the introduction, the introducing of the blockchain technology with the leveraging of other technologies such as cloud computing and internet of things, the platform uh, is really providing a wide array of functions, including logistic warehouse management, funding credit service management, uh, purchase order management, and platform administration. So there are some key functionalities and benefits of this platform. So first of all, this platform is a permission-based, uh, it's an enterprise blockchain based on Hyperledger Fabric. Uh, it is used as a foundation of trust mechanism, including, including distributed ledger, encrypted signature, uh, validation, synchronization, and a, and a block link storage and the private security. It also connects third-party services uh, for, for its risk control, such as uh, the, the Ant cre Credits, which is a subsidiary of the uh, Ant Financial Group. It also implements uh, the user interface based on web technology, including, black, including a blockchain, blockchain implementation IOTs, uh, BDS, which stands for Breach Detect System, and also Global Positioning System, GPS, and Radio Frequency Identification, R RFID, and Image Recognition, IR. It also integrates various data sources, including ordering, purchasing, uh, warehouse logistic contract documents, and a prepayment invoice. And it, it is capable of full custody of cash flow, information flow, logistic flow, and the business flow in every transaction. And, and it further combines them to form a time span, a, a time stamped transaction records stored in the shared ledger. It brings fully transaction, uh, it, it brings fully transparent transactions details to all granted participants. So since it's a private blockchain, so each party has to be invited onto this network and given certain uh, authorizations. So each participant in the platform could have significant benefit, uh, such as uh, reduce cost, uh, accelerate, accelerate uh, to accelerate a cash conversion, and also creating new income sources. And smart contracts are designed to automatically execute transactions of the collaterals, documents, funding ownerships among participants in this cash flow financing system that encode explicit rules for shifting the ownership from one another. So with the blockchain built in trust mechanism, uh, it is unnecessary for any third party such as bank to act as intermediary. Therefore, the transaction on this platform could be much faster and more economical 
as the time cost is the key factor for supply chain and, log and logistic service industry. So uh, this will conclude my first case in China. And I will hand it over to you for your next case, Renzo. Uh, you want me to switch back? Okay. You want me to? Uh, yes, please. Hold yes, the please. for you. Okay. Yeah, please. Uh, for some reason, I have some technical difficulties. No problem. Okay, go to the next slide, please. Okay, here we go. There you go. So my case would be a uh, supply chain. Here is a, a typical food and beverage. Food and beverage supply chain um, is, uh, as we know, supply chain. Uh, blockchain is also regarded as a trust connector between uh, transacting parties. It can therefore be very beneficial in the supply chain process. Uh, it should be run with authorized identifiable partners, uh, which should have different levels of visibility and accessibility uh, of the contents in the blockchain. Depending on the accessibility level, each partner may only have access to a certain set of information. And so we are in essence of building a private blockchain network with partners, interactions with the defined methods for a customized accessibility of transactional data and the modes of accessing the blockchain network. In, uh, in this case, I'm uh, using IBM Food Trust. Uh, I don't know if, see if you're already familiar with that, but IBM has developed uh, uh, quite an interesting uh, blockchain system. Uh, below, I put also the link you can connect to. This, uh, uh, the IBM Food Trust connects participants across the food supply through a permissioned permanent and shared record of food system data. So across the ecosystem of food producers, suppliers, and retailers and more, Food Trust is working with the industry leaders to make blockchain innovation uniquely valuable and efficient across many segments of the food industry. Uh, here, as you can see, on the right side, I put the clock with starting from the producer, ending with the consumers, and in the supply chain of, uh, of, of the trip of the coffee bean, uh, it goes uh, through many different steps, the co-ops that collect from the producers, uh, sells it to the exporters, exporters give it to the shippers, the importers buy it, then the roasters have to, to roast the beans, uh, gives it to distributors, retailers, finally to the consumers and to us that we can finally enjoy a good cup of coffee. This, this whole process here, it's, uh, it's clearly building on, on blocks. And it is extremely important and it's valuable to have the concrete authentication that the source of that coffee bean that produces that coffee that we consume at the bar is in fact what it states it is. And through this, it gives a particular value because why do we have to pay an illic coffee 50% more than we pay perhaps a Lavazza basic brand? Um, does it have an explanation? Of course it has an explanation. And the explanation is exactly on this uh, supply chain uh, uh, flow. And because the way that they search for the beans, the way that they, they go and look for, for the best quality, it, it's all there and it is, and it should be put on a, on a, on a blockchain in order to guarantee the, 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 the origin and the flow. So that's why we say from producer, to customer getting the full appreciation of what I'm paying for, it, it has a value. Uh, if you move to the next one, Brian, do me a favor. Sure. Yeah. And uh, this, uh, in this uh, supply chain uh, could be a similar structure of the coffee bean we can find in, it's applicable for wine, for the olive oil, for the crops or any other product which may gain value by recording and, and tracking the history of its production line and digitize it on barcoded labels. I mean, wine is the most obvious case of uh, tampering, manipulation, um, cheating, you name it. You can use whatever uh, word on the dictionary in order to describe what is happening, has been happening, is continuously happening. Blockchain could, it, this could really bring a big advantage. And in fact, uh, in the utilization of the supply chain, a blockchain utilization, 
it, it is uh, we have already several cases uh, uh, of, um, of, of uh, companies or other institutions that are providing for uh, this kind of technology to, um, to track the origins of, of the wine. On the list uh, here uh, on the left corner, I put uh, some links you can, uh, you can check um, just because there are so many different applications that would be too much for me to go through each one of the, of the cases. But uh, olive oil is, uh, is it the same story. Why do we pay a certain extra virgin olive oil 100 while another one which still says exactly the same thing but if we pay 50, there is a logic, there is a reason. And this is all in the, in the, in the flow, in all the steps uh, of the blockchain from the source to the actual consumer at the end. Here I also say, uh, why is this so important? I find it so important, the trade between Europe and China, because the food and beverage has been the most, uh, the most traditional trade uh, uh, area uh, that uh, has connected Europe to China. And there is, there is a lot of uh, um, flow of these uh, produce that come in, every time they come into China. Chinese are looking for guarantees of origin and are ready to pay premium price for it. This, this is a key, a key element. The Chinese, especially the more wealthy ones, uh, they want to make sure that what they're buying is, uh, is what it is, what it's written. And uh, the blockchain technology could give them this certificate of origin, which goes beyond the simple, the simple stamp or the simple label that uh, says uh, coming from guaranteed and this and that. But uh, in the end of the guarantee, if I can put it on a, on a, on a barcode and uh, you, can, you can analyze it, you can trace back that particular single bottle, not just the brand, just that particular bottle from the source until the end, uh, until there, the, the, the shelf on the supermarket, it has a value. Uh, I, I, I also brought to the case of the multi phenomenon. Uh, I don't know how many of you are, are, are accustomed to the Chinese liquor, but multi is the most famous and the most expensive Chinese hard, hard liquor that is sold in China. It was brought to, to fame by Mao Zedong and especially Zhou Enlai, the, 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 the prime minister at the time of Mao, that they were great estimateurs of the Mao Tai liquor. From that moment on, Mao Tai has become the liquor of preference for all the people that want to impress other people. This, and and uh, this also is the liquor that has missed having most counterfeits in China overall. And believe me, you can find more counterfeit uh, Mao Tai bottles than the real ones today in the, in the Chinese market. So uh, that only to say that uh, the Chinese uh, is ready to pay a premium for the real thing, for the original, for the authentic uh, product that they, can, that they can buy. So it would be in the best interest to do also what also Brian in kind of way uh, uh, suggested during his uh, uh, last part of his, uh, of his presentation, uh, make an effort in my opinion, to try to, to see if there is a possibility to, to move in this direction, to make authentication of your product uh, and, uh, and, and sell them in such a way to the, the Chinese buyers, uh, the wholesalers uh, or the end market buyers, uh, giving the, uh, the degree of authenticity that is, that is coming from France, from Spain, from Italy, from Germany. And, and it has that particular value because it has gone through that particular process in the supply chain uh, traction. So um, this is uh, my part for the case number three. And we have a case number four that I leave then to Brian to continue. Thank you, Renzo. Uh, here is another case in China involved with the trade financing, uh, especially blockchain in the cross-border trade financing. Uh, in 2020, uh, the Beijing-based China Citic Bank, uh, which is country's the seventh largest lender, uh, has become the first domestic bank in mainland China to make use of the blockchain-powered cross-border letter of credit in RMB for a domestic firm. Uh, the bank make use of 
a blockchain platform called Contour to trade uh, to conduct the transaction uh, in issuing an RMB import letter of credit for an importing company located in the Guangxi Autonomous Region in southern China for a total of 18 million US dollars. So the trade finance uh, is a process whereby a financial institution grants a credit facility in order to ensure security over the transfer of goods. So in banking history, the letter of credits are typical are typically issued in paper form as part of a process that takes several days. Uh, currently, there are uh, some shortcomings uh, in the areas of trade finance. I would just name a few. Uh, first of all, it's delay of payments resulted from multiple financial intermediaries seeking to verify documentations. Uh, this process may be rather lengthy and depending on number of intermediaries involved uh, in the uh, corresponding banking chain. And the next one is uh, the manual customer due diligence must be conducted by financial institutions, including Know Your Customer, KYC review, and uh, anti-money laundering, AML checks, and financial crime compliance evaluations, FCC. Uh, also, duplicate documents can be presented to banks, uh, which may result in processing the same transaction twice or more, and the difficulties in, in identifying whether any financial institutions has already underwritten a trade. So this, uh, and, th and the next one is tempering with the financial records may occur when the communication channels that is used is not authenticated or protected against an unauthorized access. As a consequence, records may be manipulated, and duplicated, or falsified. So this contour blockchain platform uh, used by Cedex in this particular case is uh, a Corda-backed open industry platform, which is also a private enterprise blockchain to, in order to create, uh, for creating, uh, exchanging, approving, and issuing letter of credit. Uh, this control blockchain has an emphasis on data privacy by sharing transaction only on a need to know basis. So contour blockchain is a network consortium of over 50 global banks and financial companies that provides financial and trade related services only to the customers of the membrane banks. As an open platform, uh, it allows other trade finance solution vendors to offer documents for trade solutions on a contour business network, uh, which increase scale and flexibility. Processing the documents for the letter of credits on the blockchain will help uh, increase the working capital improve their risk management, uh, digitize the whole process, and uh, ensure faster settlement. Import-export document can be accessed by all parties and can be reviewed and approved in real time. Uh, so as a result, el eliminating errors and delays. So there are some key benefits of using this uh, blockchain platform. First of all, is real-time access to trade documents ensure the shipment, of, the shipment of goods is initiated in a shorter time frame, reducing time and cost of document, uh, reducing time and cost of documentaries, as well as custom compliance. And uh, the risk of duplication, the risk of duplicate documents, such as invoice and a bill of Latins, uh, is, uh, it will be eliminated. Uh, enhanced transparency, ensure compliance with, with KYC and AML, uh, anti-money laundry policies and regulations, and also facilitate the network of banks, lawyers, and law enforcement officers. Transactions can be easily traced, facilitating uh, audit process, 
this, this will minimize uh, the fraudulent activity as transactions are recorded in a transparent and sequential manner. A detailed analysis of past transactions would assist in, condu in conducting the risk assessment for future trades. For security, uh, transactions are individually verified through, comp through complex cryptography and to ensure there is an authenticity. And also collaboration is enhanced as transacting entities can share trade finance related data with, it, with one another. Also autonomy is increased as the introduction of smart contracts removed any reliance on a correspondent bank and payment and transfer fees. So uh, in the end, all of these initiatives opens a particular int particularly are interesting to uh, interesting opportunities for SMEs, the small medium enterprises, which often struggles to obtain trade financing because because of lack of sufficient collaterals or poor or not existent credit history. Uh, by giving financiers greater visibility into the supply chain cash flow and a credit history of company. The blockchain can facilitate KYC processes and also ease SME's access to affordable finance. So this will conclude my case. So Renzo, do you want to try the next one? Okay, I think I, I gained already back the ownership of the presentation. Great. Yeah, uh, and uh, the, this is the last case that we are presenting to you, and, um, and it's kind of a, a bit up, out, of, out of context, if, if you wish, because here it's, the, it's a one whole country that basically went, uh, went uh, uh, into a blockchain system, basically in the so-called e-system. And it is Estonia, where E is the ubiquitous particle. And I must say that uh, this has been quite an interesting case. Uh, so rather than uh, putting up slides, I simply take you to the, the web page. And this is the web page of the eestonia.com. You can go and click it yourself. Uh, quite an interesting story behind this because uh, Estonia went through a pretty heavy cyber attack in 2007. Uh, government uh, banks, uh, some other institutions were hacked and uh, which caused a severe damage uh, to, to this country. What then they did, they, they, they moved on and they really kicked in into uh, the e-system and they built uh, almost everything is based on in, in a digital form. They develop their own KSI, so-called KSI name of, the, of, of a blockchain, which is used in many other functions. As I'm scrolling down their, their um, website, you can see all the different areas that they have utilized. They have moved into a, an electronic-based uh, system. It's the e-identity, the interoperability of services, security and safety, uh, healthcare, um, the, uh, the, the number of things that they have really done is, uh, is amazing. Uh, Estonia, I remind everyone, it's, uh, it's a country of 1.3 million people. So we're not talking about a, a large country, it's about similar to Slovenia for, for that matter, but extremely, extremely efficient, extremely dynamic. Uh, they went into e-governance, mobility services, business and finance, education and research. As you scroll this in on each one of these e uh, dot 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 whatever, uh, you can you can click and you go into more explanation of what they are doing and how they are organized. Of this, uh, out of uh, really of a sheer curiosity, and I found to be very interesting, I picked the data embassy. The data embassy is a really a revolutionary concept. Uh, and I read, or we can read together uh, from, uh, from the website. It's an extension 
in, in the cloud of the Estonian government, which means that the state owns the server resources outside its territorial boundaries. This is an innovative concept for handling state information since states usually store information within their physical boundaries. So data embassy resources are under Estonian state control, secured against the cyber attacks or crisis situations with the KSI blockchain technology and are capable of not only providing data backups, but also operating the most critical services. What they, what they have done here, they have uh, come to an agreement with the country of Luxembourg, uh, where um, they have a tier four level security. The, the highest level of data facilities are in there. So it, it is a, an, an extremely, extremely interesting thing. And they're actually uh, doing this, uh, uh, the, 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 like uh, they have the rights of, uh, of a physical embassy, such as the immunity. And this is all related to uh, this uh, storage that has been uh, um, put uh, under the Luxembourg government, uh, which uh, as, and, and they have registered this basically as a, a secondary embassy of the Estonian government. So uh, quite an interesting uh, case, I would say. Um, it, it has been interesting to, to see how how this thing has uh, has developed, and how uh, the opportunities are always there in order to come up with uh, with the different situations and different conditions. So um, at this point, I would be really basically finished with my presentation, um, and uh, in conclusion to our presentation, and then I will hand it back over to Laura for some uh, uh, closer remarks and some Q&A if we still have a bit of time. Uh, although I'm, see, I'm seeing that we are pretty much uh, 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 burning uh, all this uh, three hours that were allocated to us. But uh, uh, my, my final comment about uh, the, the blockchain technology, it is a revolutionary technique. It is the, 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 the internet of the future, if you want, in terms of the, the phenomenon that it's creating. And it is crossing boundaries. It's given uh, opportunities uh, to different countries that um, maybe before they didn't have. Uh, it is uh, connecting people in a more clean and a more transparent way. It is also uh, avoiding to have uh, a counterfeiting, avoiding to have uh, um, illegal utilization of, uh, of assets. Uh, so it is, uh, it is something that uh, it's going to be doing good for society, good for the financial systems uh, and good for governments altogether. And I also see that uh, the trade potential between China and Europe it can be enhanced uh, by the uh, evolution of the blockchain system brought into all the different facets uh, of uh, trade and technology. So I, I think that the, the, the supply chain uh, examples could identify potential applications uh, using some kind of currency, which may be uh, a, a Chinese type, let's say of, uh, of um, trading currency, a renminbi, a digitized renminbi that could be utilized for, for a smart contracts linked to blockchain um, connectivities. So I really see that the potential for future development of the technology and uh, giving great support for the further development of the, the trade between Europe and China uh, is gonna be great, great advantage. So I think that here we are um, with um, the, from my side as a director of the USME Center, I'm very happy to have been able to um, be together with you to, to share with you some of the information together with Brian, who is more technologically uh, uh, advanced than, than I am. And I think that age has something to do with that. Uh, but um, I, I really do appreciate the opportunity. And uh, at this point, Laura, if you are there, uh, I give it back to you. And maybe Brian, if you want to say a few words uh, uh, before we close, uh, I leave it to you also for some uh, final remarks. Sure, thank you, Renzo. Uh, just, I totally agree with your uh, most your comments uh, regarding the blockchain and its potential application because I see this technology is another fundamental tool to help 
uh, uh, actually, actually to advance our civilization in a way because it, it provides our certain discipline and guide and guidelines in in terms of whether how we conduct ourselves in in a more civilized or social disciplined way and with more transparency and also into how we interact with each other with with uh, uh, in in a decentralized or more transparent way. And also, it will uh, uh, affect the governance uh, uh, for many countries, and, and, and in terms of uh, uh, regardless of policy, uh, politics or business, finance, economic action, I, I think this technology is definitely going to impact us for with, with a deep in, impact on our uh, society for a long time. Uh, and at the same time, I think. This technology will also help uh, to facilitate cross-border trade and cross-border exchanges of ideas and cultures. I think it's uh, the technology. Uh, we would try to focus on the benefit of the technology. There, uh, I think European community and in the China market, there's a lot of commonality and then and deep culture interchange intertwined with each other. And I hope uh, I can be of any uh, assistant or contribute my limited capability uh, into this process. And, and also thank you very much for inviting me to share some of this information with you. Thank you, uh, Renzo. And th thanks uh, uh, EU SME to give me, give me this opportunity. Okay, okay. that will be my closure. Thank you. Uh, Laura, you want to pick it up from here? Yes, indeed. Um, first of all, I would like to thank you on behalf of the EU SME Centers team and also on behalf of the audience for uh, making the effort to prepare and to present uh, this topic today. Um, I am not a blockchain expert at all, but uh, well, it was uh, very useful for me to better understand and to have a more um, in-depth knowledge on, on the applications of, of this blockchain technology. And I'm sure that I'm not the only one uh, among the audience that uh, well has has got a very nice nice learning today uh, thanks to you um, for those that actually um, are still there uh, we would like to kindly ask you to um, complete the survey that you will be uh, receiving and you will be notified uh, once the the webinar is finished this is very important for us because apart from uh, of course asking your opinion about the topic and about uh, our experts it will help us to understand uh, which are the topics of your interests or what would you like us the usme center to focus on in the coming events uh, or perhaps of course even in, in the upcoming uh, work we are going to be doing in regards to our market reports etc so uh, we would like to ask you to spend five more minutes with us for that purpose and uh, well, uh, as mentioned before, we are going to be publishing this uh, recording uh, shortly in, on our website, um, on our YouTube channel, sorry. So uh, if uh, somebody missed it or if you want to share it with somebody because you think it might be useful for them, feel, please feel free to do so. And uh, last but not least, I would also like to thank uh, the Belgian Chinese Chamber of Commerce as our partner in this uh, for uh, their support as well. And uh, well, looking forward to see you in our upcoming events. Thank you.